All right, well, this morning we're going to be looking at another paragraph in the, the Gospel of John, John chapter 12. Uh, I'm going to read verses 44 through 50, but we're only going to be looking at verses 44 through 46 uh, this morning, and we'll look at the balance uh, this evening. Let me go ahead and begin by reading this, and then we'll see what it says generally, and then we'll look at that first section. This is what we read in John chapter 12. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. You know, Jesus says quite a bit in this small space of, of words, but again, we're going to look at just that first part, verses 44 through 46. Now, let me begin by reminding you of what it is we saw last week. We saw that even though Jesus had, had given to the Jews, I mean virtually all the Jews in Palestine by this time, and throughout the Roman Empire, because of his ministry at the various feasts, even though he had given them very powerful evidence, irrefutable evidence through his miracles, even though he had displayed an impeccable character, on one occasion Jesus says, which one of you can convict me or convince me of sin? And there was nobody who could. I don't think we could make that same challenge and not expect to have some things coming back at us. Jesus certainly could. Impeccable character. And he also preached an impeccable gospel, a perfect gospel, the very message that, well, that it was predicted in the Old Testament that Messiah would bring, even though everything was right, everything was perfect, everything was powerful, yet the, the Jews, we read, still did not believe in him. Now it's interesting that the second part of that section we looked at last week reminded us that even though the vast majority of the Jews didn't, there were many among the rulers who actually did believe. But we saw among them that they were afraid. They were afraid to confess him openly before their peers because of the threat that had already been issued, anyone who is confessing Jesus to be the Christ is to be put out of the synagogue, is to be excommunicated from not just the religion of Israel, but the nation of Israel. He would become an outcast in society. So for fear of that, they remained, as it were, closets, Christians, undercover Christians. But we also saw last week why it is the Jews did not believe in Jesus. It was because of judicial hardening. The Lord, John said, blinded their eyes. Actually, he was quoting Isaiah the prophet who said this is what was going to happen. He blinded their eyes. He hardened their hearts so that they could not believe. Much like he did to Pharaoh, remember, so that Pharaoh would not let the children of Israel go. God wanted to bring his plagues upon Egypt and destroy Egypt so that his name might be glorified throughout all the nations. But again, we do need to remember that um, when the Lord did that in Egypt and when the Lord was doing this in Israel, God was not actually responsible for that evil that brought these things about. God didn't create the evil that was in their hearts. God simply used the evil that was already there. He withdrew his Holy Spirit and let the sin in their own hearts do its work. Their hearts were already hard against the Lord. That's the way we come into the world when we understand our condition. The only reason why we're not worse than we are is because God is restraining our sin. God simply let go of some of that restraint and let that sin have its way so that they would reject Jesus, hand him over to the Romans for crucifixion so that we could be saved. Jesus had to die. 
And so the Lord ensured that that would take place. But again, through their sins, their own sins. Now, again, does this mean the Jews were excusable for rejecting him? Of course they weren't because they were responsible for their crime. They were responsible for this sin. It was their sin that brought God's hardening judgment on them in the first place. It was their sin that he let go of that made them further turn against his son. The fault was entirely theirs because the sin is entirely theirs. Now that's important to see. They are culpable. They are responsible. They are guilty even though the Lord took this judicial action. Because now this morning we see how Jesus responds to their sin. Now I would just ask you to pause for a moment and consider what the Jews were like toward Jesus and what the world is like toward the church today and see if there isn't an application of this particular principle because how Jesus responds to their sin is the way we are to respond to the sins of those around us. Now this morning Jesus reminds them of three things. First of all, who it was that sent him. It was the Father, it was their God, the God of Israel. Who he is. He is the God of Israel. And why it is that he came. He came so that those who are in darkness might have light, that they might be saved. Now this evening we're going to see what he has to say about what will happen to them or what would happen to us or what would happen to anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus. If we don't turn from our sins and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now the thrust of what we're looking at this morning is basically this, that Jesus had come into the world to save. He came as a Savior, to offer Himself as a Savior, to offer salvation to everyone who would receive it. He did not come to judge them. He came to save them. But the time was coming, Jesus is going to remind us in the passage we're going to look at or the part this evening, the time was coming when he would no longer appear as a savior, but only as judge. We do need to understand that that is not now. Right now, he still appears as savior, but he will one day appear as judge. So our work, of course, is to try to get the gospel out, present Jesus as savior, tell them about the coming judgment, you know, warn them about that, but to, to let them know today is the day of salvation. Today the Lord is still inclined. He is still gracious. He is still opening the doors to everyone who will come to him. Now getting then to the text, Jesus first tells us who it is who sent him. It was obviously the Father. He was the Father's ambassador. We read in verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Now, let's first of all look at the fact that Jesus seems somewhat impassioned here. Okay? Jesus is said to have cried out. And I think it's important for us to understand why he was crying out and perhaps something of the tone in which he was crying out. Now, the word that is used here means that he was speaking very loudly because he wanted to be heard. But how was he speaking? Now, again, sometimes we have to try to interpret this, don't we? We have to try to understand the tone, perhaps from the, the context. And maybe sometimes it's hard to nail down exactly how he did this. You know, what, was, it, was it one of judgment or was it one of, of compassion, you see? Well, you know, we have the same problem when we look in the Old Testament. And we see, you know, how God used to um, come down and, and uh, walk with Adam. When Adam had sinned uh, and uh, was hiding among the trees, God came down, uh, presumably to walk with Adam in the way he normally did, but since the man was not there, he calls out to Adam and he says, where are you? Now again, what tone of voice did God use when he called out to Adam on that occasion? Now, um, I don't think the Lord asked this question because he didn't know what had happened to Adam. I mean, God knew that in eternity before anything had ever actually taken place. He knew what had happened. He knew that Adam and Eve had sinned. He knew that Adam was hiding. He knew why he was hiding. He knew where he was hiding. And yet he calls out, where are you? Well, what he wanted was Adam to come to him. You see, he knew where he was. Adam, where are you? Come. 
But now the question is, was this a voice of compassion? Calling the man back to himself, Adam, Adam, where are you? Or was it a call of judgment? Adam, where are you? you know? <laughs> Demanding that Adam appear right now before him that God might pronounce judgment on him. Now, sometimes we assume the first, don't we? Because we think, you know, we're in a society where God is love and God's not going to do an unloving thing. He's not going to, you know, issue this voice of judgment. But, you know, that may not be the case. You know, Meredith Klein, though, you know, there are some things in, in Meredith Klein that we, we kind of look, take a step back and look at because he was rather innovative, we might say, in his interpretation of Scripture, may well have been right that this was actually a call of judgment to Adam. We read in uh, Genesis 3, verse 8, Moses writes this, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, Klein believes that when it says the Lord appeared here in the cool of the day, it wasn't just like evening, early evening, it's nice and cool, kind of a nice atmosphere. God was all ready for his walk. And he looks around, no Adam Adam, where are you? Why are you late? Why don't you come on here, you know, let's take our walk. That's not what was in mind here, but the cool of the day is really to be translated the spirit of the day, not the day in which they were in, but the day of judgment. In other words, Adam had sinned, he had broken the covenant. God now appears as judge, and this was a summons to appear before God's throne of judgment to face the consequences. Now this could also explain why they were hiding among the trees of the garden because they heard the Lord God walking in the garden. Now we know that they were already ashamed because their original righteousness, that love for God was gone. They felt naked and exposed. It wasn't that they suddenly realized they weren't wearing any clothes like, hey, where'd my clothes go? You know, it wasn't, wasn't that. Or that somehow they were under the impression that you know, they were wearing clothes and suddenly they weren't. They felt naked, they felt ashamed, but the nakedness that they felt was the fact that their original righteousness and their love for God was gone and all that left was, was fear. Fear now that God was going to judge them for what they had done and the fact that he appears in the spirit of the day gives them every reason to try to hide from him. So what kind of a voice did God use when he says, where are you? Well, very likely he used a tone of judgment against them, calling them to the tribunal of God to answer for the crime they had just committed. Now, that's not to say God didn't have any compassion, because he did. We, we know that he had mercy on them, and he did redeem them through the one he had promised who would come. But now the question is, what kind of tone, or what tone did Jesus use when he was crying out, in the face of all these Jews who had seen all these things, had heard this message, seen the miracles, had seen Jesus' ministry, it's at the end of his ministry, and they still weren't believing in him, what kind of a tone is Jesus now going to use? Well, again, the word means to speak, it can mean to speak, in a demanding way or a commanding way. In other words, he could be speaking with some judgment in his voice, calling on them to listen because this is what God requires of them. Or it can also mean an urgent appeal, one that is given because of the dire circumstances that they're in and his desire to want to see them saved, a prophetic declaration to listen. Listen to what he has to say for their own well-being. Won't you listen to me? Because he who sees me has seen the Father. Well, I think the weight of the evidence falls on the second option in this case, particularly because of the covenant that Jesus came to bring. Jesus did not come to bring judgment. This was not the day of judgment. But he came to bring peace. He came to preach peace. He came to preach the good news of reconciliation with God, not alienation. The new covenant he was bringing was of a different character than the covenant that Adam had broken in the garden. I mean, his, that covenant basically depended upon Adam's perfect obedience upon penalty of death if he breaks it. Well, he broke it. And now the penalty was going to be executed. But this covenant that Jesus is bringing is a covenant of grace based on the certainty of his obedience, making sure that all who received him would receive that promised blessing. Jesus was bringing good news of God's willingness to be reconciled to his enemies. 
if we will only repent and believe in his son. That was his message. So but the point is basically this. Jesus had not come for judgment, at least not yet. He will in the second coming. But he had come to save. That's what he wanted them uh, to understand. That's what he wanted them to know. And so he was calling out to them with a voice of urgency. So what is it that he's calling out to them? Well, again, in verse 44, he says, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Jesus is pointing to the true authority behind his being there. He's not coming to them in his own name. He's coming to them in the name of his Father. He's not coming to them with his own message, but with the message that his Father had given him to preach. He is the ambassador of their God, the God of Israel. Yahweh sent with a message of reconciliation. And what that means is Jesus being the personal ambassador of, of the God of Israel means if they believe in him and they receive his message, they would not merely be believing in him, but they would also be believing in the one who sent him, which is the Father. You say you believe in God. You say you believe in the God of Israel. If you receive his ambassador, you're receiving him. As a matter of fact, that's what you need to do because he's the one who sent me. You know, I just thought it was interesting here, too, because we often find ourselves, again, focusing on Jesus so much, and nothing wrong with focusing on Jesus, right? But we don't want to focus on Jesus to the exclusion of the Father. He who receives the Son receives also the Father. When we trust in Jesus, we are trusting in the Father. When we receive Jesus, we are receiving the Father. Now Jesus, when he says you're not receiving me or believing in me, but you're believing in the Father, he is not saying that he is not the object of our faith. But if we trust him, we are also trusting the one who sent him. If we receive him, we're also receiving the one who sent him. We can't have one without the other, which is why, of course, anybody who says they believe in the God of Israel, but they reject Jesus Christ as his son, cannot believe in the God of Israel. You have to take them both, or you can't have either. We can't have the Father without Jesus. And we can't have Jesus without the Father. So again, let's remind ourselves of the fact that, that God the Father is the one who sent Jesus into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That we owe our salvation not just to Jesus Christ, but also to the Father. And we also need to remember the work of the Holy Spirit. We owe Jesus everything for his sacrifice, to be sure. But let's not forget who it is that sent him into the world to sacrifice himself. It was a work of the triune God to be sure, but the Father is often the one representing the triune God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the Father sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The Father is very much involved, and he deserves to be recognized, worshipped, and honored for this work of salvation. The Son was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure that He might do this work and that He might become the source of the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes so that we might believe and that we might go out into the world and make disciples of all the nations. The Spirit of God is also very much involved in this work. So basically all the members of the Godhead are equally involved. They are all equally God and they are all equally to be honored as God and to be honored for the salvation that they bring down to us. Jesus is the ambassador, the representative, the messenger of the Father. And if we receive him, we receive the Father as well. So that's who Jesus is. He is the ambassador of God. He is God's ambassador, his messenger, his representative. But now that brings us to the second point. Well, who is Jesus? You know, he is the ambassador, but he's more than that. I think we understand. He is God in our nature. He is the perfect image of the invisible God. Jesus goes on to say in verse 45, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. Now an ambassador comes clothed with the authority of the one who sent him. That's always the case because that's what an ambassador is. 
But the, an ambassador doesn't always come, the one who comes, I should say, who is the ambassador of the authority who sends him, does not always share the nature of the one who sent him. Sometimes that can be good, sometimes that can be bad. In Jesus' case, it's good. He shares the same nature as his father because he is God. He's the only one who really could do this. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Can any of us say that? No, because we're not as much like the Father as Jesus. We're just barely like the Father because we're sharing some of that image of Christ. But Jesus says, hey, when you look at me, you see the Father because he is the eternal Son of God. Remember what John wrote in John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. He has revealed Him. He has exegeted Him. He is the one who, by looking at Him, you can understand. Now, Jesus is also shortly going to say to Thomas in John 14, verses 7 through 10, If you had known me, Thomas, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know Him and have seen Him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. When we look at Jesus, we are looking at the Father. Jesus says, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. Now when Jesus said that, he's not saying when you look at me, you see the eternal, infinite, immortal, unchangeable God, because when you look at Jesus, you see his human nature. He's not saying that I and the Father are one person, as some cults actually believe, because the Father loves the Son, he sends the Son, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They are obviously different persons. But what he is saying is that he shares the same moral character as his father. This is something that he shares in common with him because he and the father share the same divine nature. Now this is what makes him the perfect one to make the offer that he is making and to represent the father in this offer. The offer of the gospel, which is what we see next. And by the way, I'm, I'm laboring these points because they all have relevance to us as well. Okay, so we're going to come back and see how these apply to us in just a moment. So lastly, we see why it is that Jesus came. Well, he came to be the Father's ambassador, but with a specific purpose, to offer salvation to all who would receive it. He says in verse 46, I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus is saying basically he has come to reveal to us God's truth. Light is a metaphor for truth. He has come to reveal the truth about our condition. We're not so good. We're lost and dead in sin. We need a savior. He's come to reveal the truth about salvation. That his father has provided it in him. And that he willingly gives it to whomever will receive it from him. He came so that if we would believe in him, if we would turn from our sins and trust in him, we would not remain in darkness. And darkness, of course, is a metaphor for ignorance. It's a metaphor for sin, you know, moral evil. And it is a metaphor for judgment. And we, all three of those things are true of us as we come into the world. I've come as light, so you don't have to remain in darkness. You can have light, you can have God's truth, you can have hope. A hope of eternal life if you will only trust in Jesus Christ. Now, as I've said, I'm going to come back and, and make application. Well, let's, let's begin with this one. The first application is, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, you are in the dark. Okay, you're in darkness. The darkness of ignorance, the darkness of moral evil, the darkness of God's judgment. You are under His judgment. And you have no light. You have no hope. No hope of any good future, only the hope, it's not even a hope, but only the certainty of damnation and judgment in hell forever. 
But the good news is this. Jesus came for people just like you. He came as light so that if you would simply listen to him, if you would simply believe in him, that you would not remain in darkness, you would not remain under judgment, ignorant and in sin, but that you might have the light of life, that your life might be changed, that you might have his truth, that you might have a heart that's changed so you're no longer under the darkness of sin, and that you might also have the hope of being in heaven one day with him because that's the only way you can come to him is through him. So do you want this hope that the Lord brings? Do you want to see light at the end of the dark tunnel that you're in? You need to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus. He will give you hope. He will be your light. He will guide you safely from this world to the next and he will make sure that no one ever takes you away from him. Now again, I think we get a little bit of the thrust of what Jesus, what, what he sounds like as he's talking to these Jews. He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in the one who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that those who remain or who are in the darkness will remain in darkness, but will have light. He was calling out and entreating them, begging them, urging them to come. And Jesus says, that is what he will do for you if you will come to him. Now, have you already received Jesus? Well, then there's a few things here that apply to you as well. Now, the first one is the Lord, we understand from all that we know about Scripture, all that we've been looking at for the past several weeks, all that we've been studying in Wednesday evenings, that when the Lord saves you, He also at the same time changes your office, as it were. He makes you to be ambassadors. There's nobody that the Lord saves that he doesn't at the same time make ambassadors of the gospel. We are the Lord's stewards, entrusted with basically his goods. Nothing that we have we can say belongs to us. It all belongs to him. He gave it to us to sustain us, but he also gave it to us in order to promote his work on earth. But he has also called us to be his ambassadors, to share his truth, to share his light with others to share the gospel. Again, that's what the Great Commission is all about. It's presented to us in different ways, under different names and, you know, different images and so forth, but it all amounts to the same thing. The Great Commission is go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations. Who is it that goes? Disciples, but ambassadors. Jesus was the ambassador of his Father, and now we are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That's why he calls us the light of the world. Remember Jesus said, I've come, I've come as light into the world. But he also said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. You and I are because we've trusted in Jesus, because he's given us his gospel. Now we are those he has commissioned to bring the gospel to others in the same way that those, again, who received him, received the one who sent him. So those who receive us receive him. When Jesus sent the 70 out to preach the gospel before they went out, he said in Luke 10, verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Now, basically, what that means is that we are standing in the same position that Jesus was standing in. He came to represent the Father. He came to preach the gospel on his behalf. Now Jesus sends us to preach the gospel on his behalf. If they receive us, they receive him. If they receive him, they receive the one who sent him. So by receiving what we say, they receive the Father and his whole work of salvation. They're received in the household of God. All those things are true. But if they reject us, they also reject Jesus and they also reject the Father. I'd say that's a pretty important position that the Lord has given to us, but it's something that applies to each one of us. We are his representatives, his witnesses, his ambassadors. Now, the second question is, how can we measure up to this call? I mean, how can we do this effectively? How can we go out and share the gospel and not end up doing more harm than good? I mean, we think about Jesus representing the Father I think we've already looked at Jesus 
can honestly say, which one of you can, can you know, tag me with sin, accuse me and make it stick, can charge me and, and bring that, as it were, to a, uh, a judgment? Well, none of you can. But the same can't be said about us, right? So how can we be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and not do more harm than good? Well, Jesus actually made provision for that, you know. When the Lord saved us, he gave us his Holy Spirit so that not only would we trust in Jesus, but that our lives would be transformed into the same image of our Lord Jesus Christ. If, if we are trusting in Jesus, we are all like him to some degree. You know, some more, some less, but all of us to some degree, which means that to some degree we are already equipped to be messengers, to be ambassadors of the good news of the gospel to others. Now, are we where we're supposed to be? Do we, do we present that image and that character of the Lord Jesus Christ the way that Jesus wants us to? Well, no. Can we be better than we are now? Yes. And that is the reason why the Lord wants us to follow Him. That's the reason why He wants us to be filled with His Holy Spirit and not filled with sin or filled with the world or anything that is contrary to Him because the more we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the more we are like Jesus Christ, the better ambassadors we are going to be for Him. So we need to take to heart what Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The more we're filled with the Spirit, the more we're going to be like Jesus Christ. And it is true. What you feed your mind, what you indulge in in this world, you know, if, it, if it's not of the Lord, it's going to make you more like the world. And the more you, in, you fill your mind and your heart with the things of the Lord, the more you are going to be like Him. Now, who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like the world? Do you want to be like Jesus Christ? Well, that dictates what you should be doing with your time and what you should be filling your mind and your heart with, the things of the Lord. Now, one other thing I want to mention is this, is let's not forget that a person's turning to the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't depend on us as much as it depends on the work of the Spirit of God in their hearts, opening their eyes, changing their hearts. If we are at all like Jesus Christ and we share his gospel with others, Jesus says, all the Father gives me are going to come to me. They are going to come. My sheep will hear my voice, but they're going to hear it through us, you see. And they're going to hear it as the Spirit of God takes that and actually applies it inwardly. If we are believers and if we share the gospel, they will come. That's something we were focusing on on Wednesday evening. We have to believe that because that's what the Lord said. When Jesus said that regarding himself, he didn't mean just at that time and just at that place, but he meant from that time forward. My sheep will hear my voice. All the Father gives to me will come to me. And the way they do that is through his ambassadors, that's us bringing the gospel to others. They will come. So we don't have to think we have to be perfect before we... We go out and do this. We just need to start doing it. And lastly, since the Lord has called us to love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, and since he has given us a message, which if they believe will save them, we do need to follow Jesus' example of speaking. Okay? That, that is one thing we, we saw at the, uh, the very beginning. And Jesus cried out, and he said, and he again presented the gospel to them, right? We need to follow Jesus' example of entreating other people, pleading with them, begging them to come, urging them to come that they might be saved. Remember, we want to come across as not just indifferent. Here's the gospel, take it or leave it. But we want to come across as those who believe what we say, and who believe that what we say is going to have a very important impact on what's going to happen to these people we're talking to. And we also want to care about them and be concerned about them. One other thing we saw on Wednesday nights is, you know, love conquers all. If you really care about somebody, if you really love somebody, and you know they have some kind of a need, you will 
break down doors, you will overcome every obstacle in order to get to them and to meet that need. That's the kind of love and concern and care that we need to have for the lost to get the gospel to them so that they will be saved. Because if we don't speak and they don't hear, they're going to die someday. They're going to go down into hell. That is certain. But if we share the gospel with them, there is the hope that they might be saved and be into that, in that same heaven that one day you hope to be in, the one you believe in, the one that you trusted in Jesus Christ so that you could be in. If you believe that, then you know it's true not just for you, but it's also true for them. You know Jesus is the only way. They need to hear the gospel. You may be the only one who will ever bring it to them. Don't expect somebody else to do it. Take every opportunity the Lord gives to you. It is a great honor. It is a great privilege. You'll be rewarded for it. But if you care about that individual that you're speaking with, that's the only thing you can do. If you love the Lord who calls you to do it, that's the only thing you can do. Remember, if, you, if we don't tell them, they will perish. But if we tell them, the Lord may, in His grace, save them. We can say this with certainty. He will certainly save everyone. The Father will spring everyone that He has given to Christ, to Christ. All of His sheep will hear His voice. We just need to speak so they can hear His voice. Well, may the Lord give us grace to do that. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to um, help us apply what we've heard and uh, purpose to put on uh, what it is, this behavior that He calls us to, to be His ambassadors to those in darkness with His light. Let's pray.